possible to keep the slaves in the courtroom overnight, and the marshals decided to take them to the Hammond Street station house of the city police. They were compelled to walk there because the cabmen drove off, fearing that the shouting crowd would destroy their cabs if they accepted the passengers. After the slaves were locked in a cell, Gaines, uh, Archer fucking bald Gaines, Archibald KKK Gaines came in with the body of the dead child. It was now about 3 p.m. The gardeners had been in Cincinnati, nine crowded hours. In the station house, the slaves awaited the process of law. Margaret Gardner sat as though stupefied, but she roused herself when the compliment was paid. Her and her fine-looking boy, she replied sadly, You should have seen my little girl that... She did not like to say who she was killed. That died. That was the bird. She had a scar on the left side of her forehead, ran down to her cheekbone, asked how that she came by the mark. She replied, white men struck me. While the federal law was acting to send the slaves back to Kentucky, friends of the gardeners were not idle. A writ of habeas corpus was obtained from Judge John Burgoyne of the state's probate court. Um, and more and more and more and more. So lots of legal wrangling about what the fuck's going on afterwards. Um, right, and there's a gruesome fucking picture of what happened there. Let's see. Um, a few things at the time reveal the horror slaveries, except for, you know, that. Americans, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe was inspired in Maysville, Kentucky to write Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852 because of... Um, shit that was going on in Kentucky, the run for freedom of that character, Eliza Harris, was based on a woman's actual escape at Ripley. Author Anne Hagedorn reported in her 2002 book, Beyond the River, the untold story of the heroes of the Underground Railroad. The plot of the 22-year-old pregnant Margaret Gardner is only 22 years old, too. Four fucking kids um, pregnant, getting raped every day by Archibald fucking K. Gaines. And uh, Margaret and her husband Robert were escaping with their two boys and two young girls in 10 degree weather. According to accounts, Margaret cradled their infant girl Scylla uh, as they trudged through the river's ice and painful cold just before dawn while Robert held two year old Mary. So there's an infant girl Scylla and then there's a two year old Mary. Um, the Margaret and Robert, so it wasn't even a baby. They keep saying it's a baby. She's, she's two years old. It's not a baby. <laughs> Um, but it's two years old, and there was a smaller one. There was a younger one. So the Margaret and Robert were owned by separate Boone County families and worked on nearby farms. They had married years earlier with their owner's permission. Their family of six was accompanied in its escape by 11 others, including Robert's parents, with at least some of them crowded into a large horse-drawn sleigh over ice-covered roads on a 16-mile trek to the river. They crossed... The river west of Covington, the 17 split up with Gardner family hiding temporarily in a relative's house west of Cincinnati. The other group reportedly followed the Underground Ra Railroad into Canada. Archibald fucking K. Gaines owned the Maplewood Farm near Richwood. Margaret is said to have lived part of her life. Gaines and a son of James Marshall who owned other slaves who fled gathered an armed posse. The posse included Boone County Rebels, Boone County fucking Rebels. They still have, like, Confederate fucking mascots on their fucking, you know, Boone County is, like, the home of the fucking Tea Party. It's some of the most, like, fucking rowdiest fucking shitheads in the whole fucking state. That's where the, um, uh, Creation Museum is. So you got, you know, all these Tea Party fuckheads, and you got the Creation Museum, and you got, um, you got these racist Confederate fucking pieces of shit. So the Boone County Rebels, that's like their fucking mascot, you know, they haven't fucking, you know, progressed at all. Boone County is still like this. It's incredible that I live so close to all these things from, ha you know, all these things and never, it was never mentioned to me. Nobody ever said shit about some of the most atrocious, horrendous events that happened. You know, in Richmond, that's where my mother, my mother grew up, you know, in, near Richwood. Um, right. And I guess, I guess my, the other one too. So the um, uh, Cincinnati abolitionist Lucy Stone insinuated in court testimony that Margaret Garner's children were fathered by Archibald Gaines. The faded faces of the Negro children tell too plainly to what degradation the female slaves submit. The book quotes Stone as saying, rather than give her little daughter to that life, she killed it. If in her deep maternal love she felt the impulse to send her child back to God to save it from coming woe, who shall say she had no right to do so? Stone added that desire had its root in the deepest and holiest feelings of our nature, implanted in black and white alike by our common father. So that's uh, that's Margaret Garner, right? Fucking sad, sad, horrible fucking story about her um, the fugitive slave law of 1850. 
Um, the murder in the state of Ohio, the longest fugitive slave case of the era. Intense courtroom drama, which excluded black spectators. No black people could be in the fucking courtroom. It riveted the nation for about a month. The gardener's lawyer, John Lalliff, argued the family is entitled to their freedom, as both Margaret and Robert had previously been taken to Cincinnati by their respective slaveholders. Blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. So, here's uh, some other vigilantes <laughs> on an upswing. You got a 12-year-old who um, is a vigilante. Someone had ransacked her fucking grandmother's house, and a 12-year-old black woman, black girl, um, researched it, followed the guy, found the shit, basically did all the fucking police work on her own, and uh, it's an incredible story. So... In July 2011, two thieves broke into a house in Fitzgerald, Georgia and stole all the furniture. The homeowner had died a few years earlier and her family only came around once a year. So the thieves could have probably taken the walls and ceiling too if they found a sack big enough. By the time the neighbors noticed that the doors opened and called the cops, the criminals were long gone. But they weren't counted on being tracked down, confronted, and forced to confess to their crime by the 12-year-old detective. That's 12-year-old Jessica Maple. So, Jessica Maple, I hope it's not a slave name. It, regardless, it's okay. Uh, whose late great-grandma owned the newly empty home. Maple asked her mother to take her to the crime scene and found something the authorities had missed, a broken window in the garage and multiple fingerprints. So, that's great. You know, you got broken window in the garage, you got fingerprints. The cops are still trying to process this new information or pretended to when Maple managed to locate all the stolen furniture at a nearby pawn shop. At this point, she called the main detective involved in the case and told him, I did your job again. But it isn't the end of the story. The pawn shop owner, who apparently didn't think it was weird when two jackasses came to the store dragging an entire grandma-style living room, also happened to have the pictures and IDs of the two guys rather than giving that info to the inept police department. Maple and the single most permissive mom in the history drove down to the address on one of the ideas and confronted the 17-year-old Robert in front of his mother. About this uh, vigilante case that had happened in Georgia, this... Um, for 12 year old girl Jessica Maple followed the pursuers and then um, uh, uh, someone had took all the stuff out of her old grandma's house and she had found fingerprints found who it was went to the pawn shop owner got the ID from the pawn shop owner and confronted the 17 year old Robert in front of his mother he at first denied having anything to do it but eventually Maple kept questioning him until he finally broke down and confessed to the crime and it, probably anything else. And then eventually the police got around to arresting him. So thank God for um, Maple, Miss Jessica Maple. She's a vigilante star. She's a hero. So that's, um, that's a good vigilante. You also have here in Mayfield, Kentucky, there's a black girl that was found dead underneath the bleachers of the high school. And so the board housewife solves the murder that... Uh, baffled the police for years. So in 2000, a housewife from Mayfield, Kentucky named Susan Galbraith learned that the brutal murder, um, about the brutal murder of 18-year-old Jessica Curran, the mother of a young boy. After watching the local police botch the investigation, Susan Galbraith, who had never met the victim and had no experience whatsoever catching, catching criminals, decided that she would solve the murder herself. Literally not knowing where to start, Gabbard began writing to celebrities like Oprah Winfrey and Julia Roberts. The only one who replied was British journalist Tom Mangold from the BBC show Panoram Panorama. Gabbard basically told him, You think you're hot shit? Then come here and help me crack this case. Mangold hopped on a plane to America, and the first thing he did was buy two cases of fancy wine to fuel him through the investigation. Eventually, they find out that it was Quincy, Quincy Cross, and they, they captured the guy. They found that guy because they had got one of the people that was involved in the murder they had covered up to tell on the others, and then all five of them go to jail, including Quincy Cross. So they found you know the killer of Jessica Curran, and it was Quincy Cross. And then you also have, um, you know, these are just good vigilante things that had happened. The... Um, there's lots of KRS statutes to go through. There's 431.005 arrest by peace officers by private persons. And so that really nails, you know, hits the nail on the head for, um, for how private people should be able to arrest people. 
So how do, how does a person make an arrest? How does a person by private persons? How do you make a citizen's arrest? Well, four thirty one point zero zero five tells you. It says a peace officer can make an arrest in obedience to a warrant, without a warrant when a felony is committed in his or her presence, without a warrant when he or she has probable cause to believe that the person being arrested has committed a felony, or without a warrant when a misdemeanor, as defined in KRS 431.060, has been committed in his or her presence. So felonies or misdemeanors um, can lead to a citizen's arrest without a warrant when in violation of KRS 189 290 189 393 189 520 189 580 511 080 525 070 has been committed in his or presence except that a violation of KRS <laughs> need not be committed so they're making distinctions without a warrant when these violations have been committed his or presence is okay but a violation of these are not okay so you really have to like map all this out to see what you know what misdemeanors and what felonies are allowed, but it does allow misdemeanors to be you know, people can arrest um, for misdemeanors. It says any peace officer may arrest a person without the warrant when the peace officer has probable cause to believe that the person has intentionally or wantonly caused physical injury to a family member or a member of an unmarried couple. So this is domestic violence. You can uh, arrest somebody for domestic violence. For the, state, the purposes of the subsection, the term family member has the same meaning as set out in KRS 403.720. The peace officer may arrest a person without a warrant when the peace officer has probable cause to believe that the person is a sexual offender who has failed to comply with the Kentucky Sex Offender Registry requirements based upon information received from the Law Information Network of Kentucky. If a law enforcement officer has probable cause to believe that a person has violated a condition of release imposed in accordance with KRS 431.064, Peace officer is officer certified pursuant KRS 15.380. A private person may make an arrest when a felony has been committed. In fact, and he or she has probable cause to believe that the person being arrested has committed it. If a law enforcement officer has probable cause to believe that a person has violated a restraining order issued under KRS 508.155, then the officer shall, without a warrant, arrest the alleged violator, whether the violation was committed in or outside the presence of the officer. That's uh, Kentucky's vigilante laws. There's actually there's a the pamphlet cut by the Kentucky Constable Association. It maps out the laws pretty well. Um, it's the constables and the sheriffs are the only people that's allowed to uh, that are basically authorized by the state to carry a gun and to carry out arrest. The jailers and the coroners are allowed to make arrest, but they are to a lesser extent than the sheriffs and the constables. But those are all the four that's allowed to make the arrest. Coroners, jailers, sheriffs, and um, constables. So... Where a misdemeanor has been committed in an officer's presence, he may issue a citation instead of making an arrest if he has reasonable grounds to believe that the person cited will appear in court, KRS 431.015. Citations will be issued in lieu of a physical arrest for violations committed in the presence of an officer. The officer may make a physical arrest for a violation committed in his presence if he has reasonable grounds to believe the defendant will not appear at the required time or if the violation is one of the several set out above from KRS 431.005. If the defendant does not appear, a warrant for his arrest may be issued. KRS 431.015. Offenses are either violations, misdemeanors, or felonies, depending on the nature and length of the punishment which may be prescribed. The terms are defined in KRS 431.060. So there's three types of violations. There's a violation, there's misdemeanors, and there's felonies. So a violation is a citation, a ticketable offense. Here's $50, show up to court, pay your fucking fine, or fight it. Um, there's uh, the misdemeanors, which can be arrested, or it could be just come to court and do the same shit, or felonies, which probably would lead to an arrest, being that felonies generally rape, murder, um, you know, white collar crime, stealing a sixty thousand dollars like Spalding University. In addition to the instances cited above, certain peace officers, including sheriffs and full-time paid deputy sheriffs, may make warrantless arrest in some narrowly defined cases of domestic abuse. Uh, KRS 431.005, when in actual pursuit of a law, violator or peace officer may cross corporate or county lines for the purpose of making an arrest, KRS 
In actual practice, powers of arrest are exercised only by the sheriff and constable. Jailers and coroners rarely make arrest. The law specifically authorizes sheriffs and constables to carry concealed deadly weapons when necessary for their protection and discharging their duties. KRS 527.020. Special statutory duties develop upon all peace officers. All peace officers must seize untaxed cigarettes and notify the state commissioner of revenue that they have done so. KRS 138.165.